So God bless you wherever you are, wherever you're at in this, this walk of life. We're thankful that you would tune in today. We also have a, a couple of new members in Japan. They're tuning in every week. Amen. Uh, they're, they're calling this their church. So whether you come present and local uh, to this studio or you come via through the internet or through television, hey, it's one Lord, one Jesus, one Holy Spirit, one word that can change our life and we make up one body in Christ. Amen. So give the viewing audience a hand clap too because that's a commitment. That's a commitment. And from all over the world, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were, we were released into Asia. The network released us into Asia. And um, it, for years, we prayed about Asia. And now we're, we're there three times a week ministering the gospel. And I say we because you're a part of it. You are a part of this ministry. You know, it's unique. Uh, when we've had to share it in the community, they, I go, we're not a typical church. We're a streaming church. Like, What's that? Is that a new denomination? You know, <laughs> it's fast. Trust me. <laughs> you have to belong to Comcast to be a part of us. No, I'm teasing. But uh, this is a way that, that the gospel is being published around the world now uh, through different means. See, there are people that have um, a phone in remote regions and remote locations, and they're watching everything through streaming. Used to be shortwave radio. Now, I'm talking, you can go to Bangladesh and somebody has a cell phone. You can be out in the, in the jungle thinking, man, how am I going to float this bottle with a message back to civilization? They go, oh, iPhone. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Amen. So, so we use all means to get the message out to believers. Uh, also, we have a website that I would encourage you to go to at onewornow.com. We post up our messages there. Uh, or ownchurch.org. You can find us there. YouTube, go to YouTube. Most of our sermons are up there within uh, a few hours of the service. You can watch it on a big panel, just like we have here, and we look just as good and fresh. Amen? It's high-quality stuff. And uh, so thank Josh and them for, for all that they do back there. Let's get to talk. Yeah, give them a hand clap. Josh, guys, God bless all of you. I mean... Seriously, you guys have the tough job. Trust me. Let's talk about fit. When I say this, if you would go in the community and you'd say, hey, how fit are you? People start pinching themselves. They're thinking, you know, um, how, what is this gauge where you, body fat, right? Your, your BMI, right? Your BMI. Yeah. Sometimes your PMI can change your BMI, right? Personal mental attitude. Positive mental attitude, provoking mental attitude, prosperity mental attitude. Do I need to keep going? Amen. Watch this. Peaceful mental attitude. But when you ask them, are you fit? They're going to, to draw um, um, to uh, or try to draw a conclusion from the physical man. You know, is the physical man in shape? Is the physical man being well attended to? And in North America, I would say we don't have a problem with that. The physical man in North America is well attended. Some of them too attended to. Okay. Matter of fact, in North America, if you don't like what you have, they have a place where you can go and exchange your parts. It's an amazing thing. It's a body exchange. You walk in there with a crooked nose, you walk out with one looking like Elvis or something. It's perfect, right? So people are very accustomed to changing this framework called the physical. That's when you say, how fit are you? First thing they'll say, oh, I'm in good shape or ah, so-so. My question is, have you been doing strength training, core training, or endurance training? I want you to start understanding right now. I'm asking in the physical, but I'm going to take it to the spiritual today. Spiritually speaking, are you doing core training? I don't believe Jesus created weak people. I believe religion likes weak people because they're controllable. I believe Jesus created a believer that was strong. I believe people that follow God have the capacity to be strong, fit, and firm in what they believe. And unshakable. 
But too many times, social-driven churches create a weakness, a feebleness as the model for the Christian life. It's not so. We are called to be strong. We're called to be courageous, brave, caring, bold, firm, tender. Amen? All these things. So let us not just pick and choose what is palatable to us, which renders us from growing and changing. Let us take the full counsel of what God's trying to develop in us as a believer. So we're fit. When you say, are you fit? What are you fit for? A sprint race or an endurance race? We talked last week about, you know what? I may be a tortoise. The good news is I'm still finishing. Amen. I may get there a little slower. That's all right. Because that just lets all those rabbits and hares that run out fast prepare everything once they cross the finish line for us people that just trek it on course, on pace. Right? Are you feeling the burn? Let me ask this. You view them by television. Are you feeling the burn? Are you feeling social tension? Are you feeling the, the burn in the community? Are you? There's another burn that I love. And it's the overwhelming, encompassing burn of the Holy Spirit that wants to take over my life. Have you ever noticed a forest fire is just someone want to hang out in the meadow? It's like, we'll just stay by the brook. No, it wants to take the whole blasted forest over, right? It wants to disfigure it. Are you feeling the burn? I know it's so spiritual. See, many people are physically in shape, but they're not spiritually fit. Put that in your notes. Many people are, in phys uh, are physically in shape, but not spiritually fit. I like what Emma said, a journalist. She said, I've exercised with women so thin that buzzards follow them to their cars. <laughs> I like that statement. It's a good one, isn't it? That's rich. Have we ever known any believers that were so thin that they were no match for the enemy? One little, and they were gone like ash, dust. Look what Joan Rivers said. The first time I see a jogger smiling, I'll consider it. Amen. Think about that. That's some deep, deep theology right there. But how many times could we say, how could I follow? Their lives are in more shambles than mine. They're more screwed up than we are. They don't have joy. They're not content. They don't regulate their life with peace. They're stressed out all the time. And we're asking the world to follow us. Something's wrong with this picture. And it's not enough to say something's wrong because we have a group of believers that are good at picking the flaws. They're great Judge Judys. But my question is, once we've picked the flaws, how are we going to fix it? That's the next phase. See, I believe you have a voice. And if you keep silent, opposition wins by default. But if you make a stand... You may feel like a spitwad trying to, you know, shoot an elephant. But the key is at least you loaded your straw and you shot a trajectory at it. You tried. And you know what? You may feel like the little engine that couldn't, but the little engine that could made it one day. Right? He did. Yeah. The key is we have to stand for what we believe. We have to make our voice heard even if it's not received. Because we give an account for our actions, what we do, what we say, and how we stand. Amen? Next, look at what um, Mark Twain said. I have never taken any exercise except sleeping. I like that one. 
and resting. Oh, I like that one too. And never intend to do any or take any. He found peace in no exercise. But he exercised his mind. His creative skill to write was honed in and it was at Olympic level. Let me say it like this. Find your race and win it. Find your lane and stay in it. Tweet that. Amen. What's fit? First, the F, forgive and forget. Have you ever heard this? Oh, I can forgive them, but I'll never forget. <laughs> what you're saying is, I want to put a noose around their neck and I want to have my hand on the lever at the guillotine that drops them at choice. Think about that. So we're going to forgive, but we're going to entangle them for a lifetime. How's that not sin? Sometimes we can forgive others, but we certainly can't forgive ourselves. Have you found this to be true? The person that forgives themselves, the person that loves themselves, are the same people that can love others and forgive others. Jesus said, make it clear and plain. To who much has been given, much is required. Amen? You've heard it said like this in the world. People that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Oh, no. <laughs> or boomerangs. I don't know who invented that invention, but I don't like that one. You throw it at your enemy and it comes back and smacks you in the forehead. It's like, bam. You want to lose a war? Issue all your warriors boomerangs. Watch. So it's one thing to forgive. It's another level to forget. Look at what 1 John 1.19 says. Is this good so far? Mm-hmm. 1 John 1.9. If we confess, that word confess, when you make the confession of faith, you set something in motion regarding forgiveness. You let the arrow out of the bow. Think about that. I'm telling you, forgiveness is so powerful. It's why we are in the body of Christ. is because He forgave us. When you made confession, the trajectory was forgiveness. Think about that. You set that in motion. Watch. If we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful. Circle that. And He's just. Some people say, oh, He's a faithful God. Yeah, He's a just God also. He's faithful and just. Meaning, faithful, authentic, and trued up. He is. And that's what I like about Him. And look, what's He faithful and just to? Forgive us. Circle it. So I present to you, it is possible to forgive yourself and to forgive others. It is possible. It goes on to say, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. Circle that. It's possible to be cleansed. Some people said, yeah, I forgave myself, but I still feel dirty. No, we got to allow it to totally renovate us. When we're forgiven, we're cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. So my question is, is his blood powerful enough to forgive your past sin? Go to the word. And determine the, the answer. Because it is. You know. It goes on to say. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whatever you can name. Whatever unright deed. Whatever transgression. His blood is powerful enough. To remit it. Not atone it. Not whitewash it. But remit it. Casting it from you. Now, I like God because if, if we followed the examples of some of the people we've all been around, He would keep a record of all the things He has forgiven, right? And when an opportune time comes for Him, He would go back to that reservoir, right? That treasury of a forgiven deed and pull it to the front, front table. And say, but, you know, uh, let's talk about this. 
But he doesn't do that. Why? He's just and faithful to cleanse us. So he forgives us and then he cleanses us. So if we say we are God's, not meaning we're the little G God, but God's property, <laughs> you got to clarify that because some of these guys take things out of context on the internet. If we say we're God's property, right? He owns the deed to us. Then we have to have this characteristic of God also that we're able to forgive people and forget about their past deeds and transgressions. Giving them a fresh start. A new hope. You know, little Johnny may have scuffed his knees and fell forward so many times, but this may be the time that he gets his stride together and really runs. Aren't you glad mom didn't forget about you or dad? Aren't you glad grandma and grandpa didn't forget about you when you had some failures? Aren't you glad God never looked at you as a failure and always is asking you to come in and be a part of his family? Absolutely. Why can't we give the same grace to others? We can. We can. Moving on. Look at this. The next one about being fit. What's the F? Forgive and forget. Look at Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another. That's a new statement. <laughs> be kind to one another. We can all work on that one, can't we? Just look forward. Amen. Tenderhearted. Look at that. Tenderhearted. Some of us are so ruddy and crusty, we got the mumps. How's your day? Mm -hmm. uh, mm. It's like we went back caveman level. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, ha, mm. All I'm asking is, did you have a good day? Mm. Well, if you don't know if you had a good day, how in the world is the rest of us going to find out? Okay, but watch this. Being tender-hearted is the opposite of hard-hearted. Some people think they can teach you a lesson by being hard on you. No. Hard on you should not be the first protocol in development. It should be tender, flexible, understanding, reasoning together. Hardness and firmness, when you look through the Scripture, is because people didn't get it the 15,000th lesson time. And then all of a sudden, there's a firmness applied. Does that make sense? I don't know about you. When we were raising our kids, I was real flexible. Oh, yeah, no problem. It's okay. It's a, they keep doing it. Okay. About the 10th time I've said it's okay, I'm done. It's like, it's not okay anymore. Okay? It's now time to learn a lesson here. Right? That's called development. Adolescent development. Why do we do that as adults? We should have it by now, right? Have you ever had a family member you got to tiptoe around because they're so crusty and hard-hearted that they're about ready to smack you? Even at the thought of messing up, they're like, I could read your mind. You were thinking about it, and I was getting ready. So, come on, this is not proper development. That creates fear in people, amen? My wife used to punch on me when we have fun. She laughed, she kind of hit me, and I started flinching. She's like, why do you flinch every time I get close? Because you always hurt me when you get next to me. <laughs> you know, that happens when you have a small person complex. You've got to come to the big people in life and try that. We have this ongoing contest, always about 6.30 at night. She goes, your hands are small. I'm like, really? you got like little baby hands. And then she puts her feet up. Look how small your feet are compared to mine. It's like her perception is she's a giant. Now, I don't know if this is faith statement or she's just trying to seed my future with some fear. But I'm telling you right now, you need to see yourself bigger than you are. Amen. More capable than you are. And more importantly, challenge yourself to become what you're seeing in your future. Does that make sense? That's good teaching, even if you are a Baptist. Amen. Praise God. I love the Baptists. <clears throat> I love the Assemblies of God. I love the... Presbytery, Presbyterians, I love all God's body. Amen? Look at this. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. That means a heart that's fresh and brand new without preconceived conclusions. Put that in your notes. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. God in Christ didn't forgive you going, I know the future, you're going to blow it again, so I don't know about this one. No, He just forgave you. He didn't draw a preconceived conclusion to the forgiveness or whether you deserved it. He gave it, granted it. 
Look at this one. Jesus said it like this. And forgive us, circle that, our debts. <laughs> forgive us our debts. We all like to be forgiven, don't we? We all like our debtors to forgive our debt. And then he goes on to say, as we, here's the action, forgive our debtors. So it's two things set in motion. There's a cause and effect, if you will. Amen. We're asking for forgiveness or freedom. And at the same time, we've got to be giving that freedom to others. Amen. Well, that was an overwhelming yes. Philippians 3.13 says this, Brothers, so now he's speaking to those that are part of the family of God. Brothers, Paul says, I do not consider myself that I have made it my own or mastered this. Philippians 3.13 But this one thing I do. Imagine that. Paul, with all of his wisdom, insight, all of the favor that he used to have and social acceptance at the government levels of the nation, is saying this one thing I do. Not the 10 keys to my wealth and prosperity and being a renewed person or a courageous man of valor. No, this one thing. This is how powerful this one thing is to get you fit for your future. If you can put this bedrock or this stone in the bedrock, you'll make it. Watch. This one thing I do, <laughs> forgetting what lies behind. That's how powerful to forget the past is. Some people live in their past when they should be forming themselves for their future. You want to be insured of a long life? Create a lot of plans. God doesn't need you until the plans are done. Well, if I could just get home. He, you don't need to be home. You need to be here doing. Amen? People retire and they expire. Tweet that. People retire and expire. Why? They, their eye grows dim like Eli. Eli, his whole leadership went away. I mean, it went off the rails. Why? His eye grew dim. It was a process of it going dim. He didn't diagnose it soon enough and change the course of it. You can be in your 80s and still go to nations. Dr. Summerall proved it. I served his ministry. Loved it. That dude would burn out 30-year-olds. Do you hear me? Larry about burned me out the last time he was in town. I'm like, drop, I've got to get something together. This man's wearing me down. And I'm thinking, I am 49. I better get fit for my future. Amen? If in your future's traveling, going abroad, get ready now. Do you hear me? It starts with the passport. Wouldn't that be crazy? The biggest door you could ever imagine open to you and don't even have a passport. Well, I can't show up to be your keynote speaker. I don't have a passport. Think about that. Be ready for your future. Amen? Or what about this? Well, you know, I can't travel because I just don't travel good. Well, you just limited how God's going to use you. I'm glad Dr. Summerall didn't have that opinion and mindset. I just can't travel. Uh, you know, God gave me an immense vision to feed the hungry children all around the world. I'm, you know, God, don't you know I'm 75 years old? God went, I don't care. Do it. No, you want to know what he said to him? I can now trust you with this vision. You weren't my first choice. Wow. I, okay, God, I'll do it. Amen. You don't want God to speak back sometimes. Because he'll, he'll put it right where it meets the road. So all of a sudden, he had the courage, the strength, the energy to step forward beyond what people in his peer group was saying he should do. He rode that jet. People thought, well, you know, to be a faith man, i got to have a jet. Oh, no, he saw that as like a mule. That will get me across the water quick, back and forth. And he literally burned the engines off of a jet. That man literally thought God would take him home if he didn't preach four times a day. That's amazing, people. You're trying to get home from your job and he's looking, I better stay at the job or I'm going to fall over dead. True story. But God gave him wisdom, what to eat, how to eat when he was traveling so he could run well in his 80s. There's insight for your future. Look at Billy Graham. 
Billy Graham is living long enough, he almost will be put in a museum. I love it. He's a man of God. Exactly. He has a tenacity of faith, of endurance. I'm like, don't think about him dying. Just stand that dude up in a museum, sell tickets, and let him share the gospel with everybody. Seriously. His son Franklin is you know, going to be the recipient of this enormous ministry. It's like, Franklin, you might as well find something else to do. Dad's going to probably outlive all of us. Amen? Dude's Methuselah in the flesh. Praise God. So what are you fit for? Are you fit for failure? Are you fit to flourish? You determine it, and it starts today. Amen? Amen? Let me give you some more verses. My wife says, man, when you teach and you give us a bunch of verses, I just love that. It's because you're a teaching gift to the body of Christ. She loves all the verses. I'm like, give me one, and I'll, I'll squeeze it, man. I'll get juice out of it. Look at that. Paul said, forgetting what lies behind, and here's the next word we need to learn, straining means pressuring the present straining pressuring the present what do you need to pressure in your life to reach your full potential what do you need to pressure in this race of life or this walk of faith what things are resisting you that you need to apply pressure because you're straining to push beyond present condition what are those things as your pastor i'm going to challenge you this next year some of you have been believing for things long enough, it's start time to click over and attain the things believing for. Amen? Let's don't excuse it away in 2016. Let's start obtaining what we petition and ask God for. I'm ready to eat some good of this land. I'm digging through Clovis trying to find some good, and I want to find it. Amen? It's a biblical promise. Wherever we're at, we're called to flourish and eat the good of the land. Amen? Praise Jesus. I thought I found it at a bakery the other day, but there's better than that. Put this in your notes. <laughs> Anyone can forgive, but it takes a big person to forget. It takes a mature person to forget. Let me put it to you like this. It takes a mature believer to choose not to count people's trespasses. When people say, you know, I want to be a pastor, I want to be a leader, I want to be a this, I want to be that. The first thing out my mouth is I ask them, can you walk in mercy all the time? Not some of the time, all the time. Can you turn a deaf ear to criticism? There's valid criticism, then there's criticism that means to harm. Do you have thick enough skin that when, the tough, time, when tough times come, you can pick it up and get going? Can you teach a word that can pass the scrutiny of people that criticize you and don't believe you? Because if you can't, that's no place for you. Trust me. There's not everybody believes the Bible the way we teach it. I understand that. I'm not trying to convince them. I was in a, in a uh, eating, no, I was in a, drinking a coffee at a coffee shop, Starbucks. It sounds old to say coffee shop, huh? When I say coffee shop, you're thinking like the diner over there on Highway 99. Well, the 18 wheelers hang out. <laughs> you know, let me give you an insight. Just because there's trucks there don't mean it's good food, okay? It's usually cheap food. <laughs> Everybody's like misnomer when they travel. There's truckers, there's good food. No, it's cheap food. But anyways, think about this. I, I'm, I'm sitting, and a man wants to joust with me the scripture. I never end to an argument over the scripture. I don't have to convince him what I believe. I know what I believe. He's never going to change me in regards to faith and the infilling of Holy Spirit and its purpose. Not going to happen. He's not going to convince me that seeding into the kingdom of God doesn't produce benefit for me in the earth. Not going to change me. I'm dogmatic about that. And I'm happy about it. I didn't ask him to listen to my CDs. I didn't ask him to get an MP3. I didn't even care if he was on the planet. I just wanted a good Starbucks. And I got this engagement. Amen? It's kind of like when one of those girls comes up and goes, would you like to dance? You go, no, sorry, I only have two left feet. I don't know how to do this. 
That's what I wanted to say to him. Sorry, I'm not going to dance with you. And he proceeded. Watch, I'm going somewhere with this. Then he wanted to challenge. Well, do you believe this? What do you believe? I finally looked at him. I said, uh, sir, let me help you here. I'm not asking you to join my church. Just wanted him to understand. I'm here to enjoy a nice cup of coffee. I perceive you are a Christian. So let's celebrate our differences and leave it there. That wasn't good enough. He told me what he believed, what to, you know, where he came, la, 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 la. And I just went, that's great. I'm glad you're fulfilled in your faith. We all should be. And that wasn't good enough. So I looked at him the next time and I said, you know what? Let me just make it very plain. With all love and sincerity, I'll see you in heaven. Have a good day. What am I trying to say? Be firm in what you believe. Know why you believe it. And whenever you're in leadership and have to give an account, rightly divide the scripture, the word of truth, as the Bible says we should be. Amen? And I can do that. But I will never engage in a simple argument because people are prideful, will not change their understanding of scripture and want to enforce it on you or me. That's when conversation ends. Now, next thing I want to look at is fruit. What is your fruit? Because whatsoever you plant will also sprout and produce fruit. If it's fruit that's juicy and good, I'll glean your tree. If it's corrupt, wicked, and detestable, keep it. Okay? Keep it. It may be good for vinegar. I don't know. But when I say fit... And when I say forgive, that's what I mean. And when I say walk tender and, and being able to reach people, that's all I mean it in con total context. But don't be a doormat for somebody just to hit you upside the head that wants to religiously joust with you. Turn away and walk away. You don't have time for that. Amen? Watch this. The next one, and this is what I had to do with this man, was intentionally love him in the moment. Right? Intentionally love. We initiate, and watch this, God propagates. We initiate it, and then God does something with it. He causes it to multiply. Now, here's the beautiful thing. I still get asked to come and preach in Baptist circles. We have some differences of our, of our tenets of faith. And we don't have aught with one another because they know me. There's relationship. And they know I'm a man of honor and respect. When I'm in those churches, I ask the pastor, if somebody wants prayer for healing, is it okay if I pray with them? And they'll in inevitably say yes. It's because I show respect. I honor them as the leader set over that house of fellowship. Right? Right? It's called respect. I was in a parish in Iceland. The priest called me to the back and he said, Darren, I want to talk with you about this Holy Spirit. I said, what would you like to know? He's getting all robed up for the ceremony. I'm, I'm glad God didn't call me into those circles. I would hate to have to put all that stuff on. Amen. I, I, it's just not me. God bless all those men and women that are in those veins of Christendom. And I'm thankful I'm not. But he wanted to know about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Serious. I'm transparent. Keith, you'll notice how I just say it straight out. <laughs> when it's live like we are, it's one thing. The other we get to edit for television. And I appreciate them. And he was so sincere. He, you know, doctorate degree in theology. But he wanted to know about this personal relationship you could have with the Holy Spirit. And we sit for just moments on end. And I would just say, this is what Scripture says. This is what Paul said. This is how Jesus introduced the work of Holy Spirit. This is where you see it in Acts. And this is what Paul and Peter said about it. Now, if you want to know more, read the Scripture. You know it well. And then ask God to reveal it to you. And I gain that priest's utmost respect. And ask me to be a part in the service. Do you see, we don't have an agenda because we have understandings of faith that maybe others don't have. We should not push 
that agenda. We should push Christ, Him crucified, and Him rose again. And then we should uh, show that Christ did a finished work and then introduces another part of God to the earth that would guide them and keep them in peace as He reveals truth to them. Do you hear me? Whether I lay hands on a thousand people and they all drop dead is irrelevant. Whether they all get raised up is irrelevant. Do you hear me? Remember what I taught you two weeks ago. The number one thing we are called to do is to give them the knowledge of Christ. Number one thing Paul said, to give them the knowledge of Christ. And then Darren said, give them the knowledge of Christ and be a good example of it in the earth. That's the new Bible coming out, the Darren translation. It's got beautiful maps. A few photos of airplanes. Yeah. For all the boat lovers, it's got a couple of boats. Yeah. Women that love shoes. It's got some real nice Italian shoes in there. Take you on the pilgrimage through Italy as you're looking at the days of the Bible through all the nice shoe shops. Ladies, no, I'm teasing. All the women will go, I want to go on that trip. <laughs> Set that up, Denise. <laughs> Watch this. Intentional love. Can you love somebody intentionally? Some people think love is a feeling. It's way beyond a feeling. It's initiated first by a decision. Feelings follow. I often say this, and, and, and I mean it. This is how we live. There's times that I look at my wife and I go, you know, I love you. I just don't like you right now in the moment. That doesn't mean I'm dishing her and going to throw her to the curb. That doesn't mean we're, you know, separating. That doesn't mean I'm even mean. I'm just being transparent. What am I really saying? You're challenging me right now and I don't like it. That's what I'm really saying. And we're so secure in our relationship, we can talk like this to each other. Now, I wonder what people think that are sitting around eavesdropping. They shouldn't be having their nose where it shouldn't belong. But can you imagine what the bystander might hear? Somebody innocent on the sideline? Our kids, they get it. They understand it. They were raised in a home that's very European. You say what you mean. You mean what you say. You don't hide nothing. You're crystal clear about everything. Because what hides in the dark, you can't fix. But what's out in the open, we can put the word on it and change it. Amen? And they saw us live this way. They live this way. And now they almost intolerable people that don't live that way. I'm always having to tell my son, it's okay, Caleb. It's all right. Be a little more flexible. No. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty interesting when he's your dad and buddy and your pastor. Think about that. You want to know what my son's doing on Sundays if he's not on the soccer field and training? He's watching dad deliver the gospel. He's learning what Scripture says about him and his life and what God said he can have. Do you hear me? Same with my daughter. She does three or four services a day. Gets home just in time to watch us streaming live. Do you hear me? She lives in England. Caleb's in Iceland. And you thought your family was disjoined. <laughs> Amen? Watch this. Intentionally loved. Can you initiate love? Can you have authentic agape? You ever hear this statement? Sloppy agape? Agape is not sloppy. It's not. If I look at you and every time you have a response, oh, good. You know that Christian smile. It's kind of like the Cialis guy. Do you see that commercial? Okay. Some of you get the, maybe I, that's a bad example. But it stands out. Okay? It just stands out my mind. I watch TV. Just keeping it real around here. Come on now. But watch this. So many times we put up a facade we put up a front, a mask, when inside we're being destroyed. Let us be mature enough that we can share our faults. We can share our needs. But let's don't camp out and rally around them and make a subgroup and culture over it. Let's grow and change so we're healed and healthy and move on. Amen? Amen. 
Hey, we all go through things in life. The key is we don't have to camp out there and build a memorial around it. Amen? I wish the Apollo mission would have created an addiction counseling session. It's one small step for mankind. Boom! Yeah, it's really a small step or a big one, but it's one and it's over. And we move on and we grow up. Amen? Sometimes we give ourselves so many excuses as to why we can't be free from our past or change as a person. Amen? Intentionally love. Authentic agape is this. God type love for humanity and it's not self-indulgent. That's how you know if you're operating in authentic love. Is it self-seeking? Is it self-gratifying? Is it harming someone else for the fulfillment of self? That's not love, friend. That could be lust. That could be a lot of other things. Authentic agape love is genuine with no strings attached, loving humanity as God sees them for his cause and purpose. Can you do that? 1 John, 14, or 1 John 4, 19 says, we, we love, and here's the key, because He first loved us. The only reason you can love is because God first loved you. One time I was having to take some vocal training. I was preaching so much uh, in, the, in the early 90s, I was blowing my voice out. And uh, um, so I went to this lady to, to try to learn how to breathe better so I didn't destroy my vocal cords. And so she invited me to be uh, a speaker at a, a big event that she had for singers and all these other people uh, that, that she was training as their vocal teacher. And I went, I, I don't play an instrument, okay? Are you sure? She's like, no, you need to stand in front of people because I want to see how you're breathing. I'm like, I am a preacher. Hello, I'll take up an offering. It's funny. She goes, that's all right. You just still need to be there. I want to see how you breathe when you're orating. I go, it's not called orating where I come from. It's called spitting when you're excited, screaming loud, and then receive an offering. You know, and so I would make her laugh because I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So she said, well, I want you to put some things together. I'm like, really? What I will put together will part the hair of everybody attending, okay? They didn't buy a ticket for this. And so uh, knowing that I was going to be amongst a lot of people that were non-believers from a very liberal side of understanding, my, my whole thing that God gave me to speak on, because I can only speak on what I'm passionate about, what I know and, and what I, I live out, um, it's, it's this, love and what is it? And how can you know it if you're not attached to the source of it? And do you know where it comes from? I had 10 minutes to talk about that without using a verse. <laughs> this is challenging. Without saying God, without saying Jesus, or amen. That, that was a hard one for me. It's like, hey, do you feel? No, they don't feel nothing right now. You're supposed to stand there. And I'm glad I was not one of those ministers. I couldn't do that. The homiletics, I failed. Trust me. Watch. And I remember it made me or forced me into a position and condition to understand why I can love somebody. And how come God could love me or why he could love me. And so it was it was very moving. And I was able to articulate the gospel creation without using God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Shundai, Shadadadada, or anything else that would be acceptable in Christian circles. Imagine that. And my last statement was, can we really love one another if we're not connected to the source of authentic love? Afterwards, everybody goes, man, that was a great sermon. What are you talking about? They caught it. Sometimes the truth you abide in protrudes out of you, and that's more authentic than the words we speak. Amen? Amen. Look at this. Initiating love, authentic agape, is a genuine, authentic care for humanity that's not self-indulgent. 1 John 4.8 says, Anyone who does not love 
does not know God. Wow. We're not to judge people, but this certainly can put it down on acid test, can't it? And if we revealed that of people, maybe we should pray for them that God can touch them, reach them, and help them. Especially going into the holidays. You know, it's a time of celebration, but it's a time that some people feel inadequate. They would like to do more based on what society says we should do during the holidays with giving and gifts and presents. Maybe we should be sensitive to those that desire to give, but they don't have the means to do it. Maybe instead of making them feel inferior, maybe we should celebrate and promote them. That you can give something, kindness, love, caring, help. Do you hear what I'm saying? Not everything under the Christmas tree needs to come from Macy's. Amen? Nordstrom's. Kmart. Walmart. I still get a Walmart card from my mother. Imagine that. I do. I do. I like to go to Walmart. It's better than going to the movies for me. I can people watch at Walmart all day long. So if you see me, I usually have my ball cap on, and I'm in like jeans and just a scruffy shirt or jacket, and I'll have a coffee or something uh, right there at the McDonald's, and I'll people watch. It's the funnest place to go. It's a human zoo. <laughs> Amen. Hey, moving on. That's not real spiritual. Watch this. Now, it's not sloppy agape, but authentic. That's the key. Let's be authentic. You know, I've often said things to people that, that don't attend our church that need some insight. I'll say, I don't care what you tell me. Just be authentic. I don't, I don't care what you say to me. Just be authentic transparent, clear, and truthful. Because I can't help people that live under a lie. I can't help people that wear a mask. I can't help people that are bound by fear and can't expose themselves for greater truth. Does that make sense? Amen. Hey, if, if, if you're a mechanic, you've got to be able to use a screwdriver on a screw. Right? A hammer on a nail. Peter, 1 Peter 4.8 says this, Above all, meaning above everything we can ascribe to. Look at this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. That's a powerful word. Earnestly means by intention. Something that's a choice. Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Hear me. To love you means that I'm loving you through the love of Christ. God loves you through Christ, which shows scripture that says that. And so the sins that was once against you are no longer remembered. He chooses to forget. Now, society may not. Civil law may not. But that's not what he's speaking of here. He's speaking of love for one another in the family of God and one another in relationship with people. Husbands and wives, parents with children. Okay? Now, I've had people come to me and say, but you know what? Love covers a multitude of sin. Yes, it does. But that does not mean that society will not punish you for your crime. Straight on. So, if you're going to be in leadership, sometimes people will say things to you that you, you can't even wrap your brain around. And the only thing that I could say in these situations is, have you asked God to forgive you? Because society never will. I had a man of big stature basically fall apart in my office one time as he was confessing what he had done. And I said, you know, I, I can deal with you from a spiritual standpoint, but you need to deal with yourself so that you don't harm others. That man went and served a prison sentence. Is still in contact with me. Lives in a foreign country. A friend to me. Hear me. Went and served a sentence for the wrong he did. 
and still calls me a pastor and leader and friend. I don't count that man's trespass against him. I choose to see him in a new light and choose to believe the best for him. Is that amazing? Matter of fact, he said, if you ever want to come to the Philippines, pastor, I will open the doors for you. Imagine that. Moving on. That's part of leadership. It's challenging at times. Look at what John said, 14, 15. If you love me, these are the words of Jesus, you will keep my commandments. He's not just talking of Moses' commandments. He's saying my commandments love one another. Think about that command. Love one another. First Corinthians 13, 4. I've got it. I'm almost finished. 13, 4. I went a little longer. Love suffers long. A lot of people say, well, what is authentic love? Let me show you. Here's the definition. This always challenges me whenever I see this. I don't like long suffering. I like short suffering. Moment by quick moment. <laughs> Look, love suffers long and is kind. You mean I can be kind when I'm suffering in love and it's long? I can still be kind to other people. Think about that. You want to talk about how to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. He goes on to say, love doesn't envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked, thinks no evil. Let's pause right there. Concerning others or self. Put that in the sidebar of your Bible. Many times you can love others and hate yourself. That's a mask. Look at this. You count the evil of what you've done, but you're so willing to forgive others and overlook their trespasses. But then genuine, authentic love does not have evil towards self or towards others. Us word of faith type charismatic Pentecostal assembly type believers, we often say this, well, you reap what you sow. What's the intent of the statement? Malice. Good word. The intent is different than the verbal speech the intent is not the, from the positive you reap what you sow you know and we just need to be aware no it's you're getting what you deserve and i just want to help you remind you of it right so that's when we say no evil concerning others or self sometimes you say in the mirror when things don't go the way that you planned or you don't get the favorable outcome you know what i sowed and i reaped it no maybe things just didn't line up yet in the area of what you're believing. Come on. Some of you have big dreams. That takes big faith. That takes big time investment. That takes big changes of self. Come on. I often say it like this. Anybody can believe for nothing and get it. That's faith in action. Right? Come on. Hey, everybody's an artist until they pick up some paint, a canvas, and a stencil or a um, brush. Go crazy on some canvas. For, we'll tell if it's art or not. Amen? Think about that. Like I say to my son, you know, everybody thinks they're an expert at soccer when they're in the grandstands, but they don't have a jersey and they're not on the pitch. All the time. This is our conversation. Son, you play for the applause of one who's watching from heaven. And when you play with the integrity uh, of, of your skill set for the integrity of the game, you're winning. You just need the right eyes to see you. And the right eyes this last two weeks have been seeing them. Can I tell you, you are this close to a breakthrough. But that could become... 10,000 miles if you don't change the way you think. Serious. Look at 
It goes on to say, verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity. Have you ever seen? I've seen that around Pentecostal people. You won't believe what they did. Woo! Shut up, shut up. They sinned big adultery. Ah, Are you kidding me? And we wonder why the world thinks something's wrong with us. They're peculiar people. No, they're dumb. <laughs> I've seen this. I've been around it. And I was appalled by it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, we used to say the phone lines are hot. Oh, no, the text messages are hot now. Hot texting. <laughs> like, Holy Ghost got on your fingers. You're not going to believe. Guess who's sleeping with who? Ha! <laughs> Guess what I heard about this preacher? I saw his kids. Oh, it's not good enough to just text it. Then you got to put it on Facebook. I'm glad they didn't ask me to name that thing. I wouldn't have called it Facebook. I'd have called it something else. Anyways. But watch. It doesn't rejoice in the iniquity of others. It understands what sin is and the power of it. But it also understands the power of forgiveness and restoration. Does that make sense? Authentic love. These are the definitions of it. But rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, bears all things, believes all things, meaning believes the good, <laughs> not the bad, hopes for the good of all things for others, and endures on the behalf of others all things. Watch verse 8. Love never fails. When we're failing, it's not because of love. It's because of something else. Put this in your notes. Love is not self-indulgent or self-seeking, but patient and kind. It's outward flowing. Authentic love starts in the heart, propels uh, out of our actions towards others for their benefit. It starts by a decision, friends. I've had couples say, I don't love him or her anymore. Years ago, Drop and I, we looked at and it flew out her mouth. You fell into it. Can't you fall again? Don't you love a new couple? We just fell in love. Well, if you fell once, you can fall again. I'll help you. Close your eyes. Smack in the back of the head. You're going to fall. Think about it. Because it's initiated before the feelings catch up to it. It's a force. And then feelings come along. See, we've been schooled in the feeling side of it and then the other later. So we feel like we're in love and then we feel like we're out of it. No, you're either in it or you aren't. We're in love and the feelings will surround it eventually. Amen? Almost finished. T, terrific trusting. Let me give it to you real fast. It's this. Excited about in whom you've invested your trust. Seeing favorable outcome before it comes out. Can you see a favorable outcome before it comes out? That's what faith is. That's what believing is. That's what trusting is. It's believing God at His very word for a favorable outcome even when you don't see it. It's not this kind of faith. I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it. No, that's not faith. That is not faith. Faith is I believe the outcome according to what Scripture says even though I don't see it yet. Right? Psalms 1 12, 7 says, He is not afraid of bad news. Be a person that's not afraid of bad news. Stop allowing bad news to be your truth. Start being a person that says, I hear bad news, but that does not concern me. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It rains on the just and the unjust, and I know what to do with water. Come on. Amen? But sometimes we hear bad news and we make that our greatest headline. Psalms 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Him my heart trusts. And I am helped. That's past tense. I am helped. My heart exalts. And with my song, I give thanks to Him. My question is, what is your lyric? Is it worthy of a song? Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Like your friend sings. If you're looking for love in all the wrong places, you'll keep getting all the wrong stuff. Okay? Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. Look at this verse. In perfect peace. 
means God can keep you stayed in perfect peace. But now for you to have it, here's the combo. Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. You can't be in perfect peace if you don't stay trusting in God. Amen. This is good preaching. Look at this. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of a man brings a snare. And we want to blame the devil. The fear of a man brings a snare. I present to you, Job went through what he went through because he said this, quote, that that I feared the most has come upon me. It wasn't God doing anything. It was his fears opening and breaching all kinds of protection. Amen? Let me give it to you like this in modern day understanding. You guys, anybody in here have this credit thing called, uh, what's it called? Help me. Huh? No, not a FICO score. It's where they protect your credit report. Identity theft. What? Huh? Yes. Okay. Um, you have that? Okay. Anybody have that? Yeah. Life, life lock. Things like this, right? Okay. And what happens if I have life lock and I go taking my credit cards and handing them out here on Shaw Avenue, handing my driver's license and my social security number and my bank statements? Life lock's not going to help me too well, are they? They're going to probably say, you know what? Um, in your situation, our policy doesn't cover it because you breached it based on your ignorance, actions, Right? You notice they're not even going to call that an act of God. They're smart enough not even to do that. So back to Job, that that I feared the most has come upon me with his own mouth, with his own thought process and verbalization, verbalizing of the thoughts. He opened and breached all the protection around him. Not God, Job himself. Read scripture. And by the way, it wasn't a lifetime. Some scholars say six months, some say nine. And if I had to endure for nine months and everything was added back a hundredfold, that's not a bad gig, right? I mean, I don't claim to be brilliant, but I can add one plus one equals two. Amen. Moving on. One more verse. Can you take one? Two more. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of a man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Put that on your eyelids and tattoo it. Because let me tell you something. We understand there's terror in the world and terrorists. But you know what? As for me, they're not going to snare me and the Lord will keep me safe along with God's wisdom. Do you hear me? And God's leading and leadership. Does that make sense? Now, media would like you and I to believe we've got Al-Qaeda living across the street, hanging out at McDonald's. I don't believe they are. Right? I don't. Matter of fact, you want me to get real technical, you know, the best place you could hang out at is what's that uh, barbecue pork place over on Blackstone? Because they don't eat pork. Come on now. Be smart about this. Pork ribs are from God. Short rib. Keep you safe. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man whose trust is the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Amen? Blessed is the man. We don't, call, we don't need to live in fear. We need to live in faith. And we need to live in trust. And our trust produces a hope that has the power to change the outcome. Amen? Praise God. Has the power to change the outcome. You know, we started praying as a church that suicide bombers, that the bomb blast would internalize and would retract inward instead of outward. It wasn't long after that, we had one of those hit the headlines. They went to set his bomb off, the only person that blew up was him. You want virgins that bad? Boom, get them, right? Just don't hurt the rest of us. We've got a destiny to live out in the earth. Amen? Praise God. I mean, what headline are you going to live by? The just shall live by faith. That's a great headline. Amen? That's a great headline. And I will be kept in perfect peace because my mind is stayed on him. That's a great headline. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's a great weapon. That's a great headline. 
No weapon formed against me will prosper. None. Amen? None. You may say, well, that's just like an ostrich burying his head in the sand. And I'd say, you're almost truth. No, that's like a farmersville boy that believes the scripture burying his head in the sands of heaven. And I'll keep it there. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? I have been in harm's way many times. Many times. One time I was in harm's way with people from the holy Mecca of faith movement. And you want to know who was talking doubt and unbelief and fear? That crowd. And I'll never forget, I was so upset. So upset. We were the ones dealing with the officials. They were the ones sitting there, you know, talking all the stuff. And I said to them, you know, you guys can stay here if you want. But I'm not. I have a blonde wife to go home to and two blonde kids. And I'm not dying here today. Thank you. End of story. It wasn't even 48 hours later. The officials in the top seat of that nation released us. Escorted us to the airport. Escorted us through the airport and put 31 of us on an airplane, bumped everybody else, and we flew home with their Olympic team. That's how God does it. So I led their number one heavyweight boxer for that Olympics to Jesus Christ and a couple of their swimmers and divers. I'm like, you stupid devil. Put me in here. I'll get them all saved. And guess what? Their president can't touch me at 41,000 feet. I was up there saying, can't touch this. Can't touch this. True story. We got a bunch of them saved. A communist country. See, some people could have died there. But we made the choice to live and move forward in our future with Christ. And this is our safety. This is our safety net. Amen. Put your Bibles away, your phones, your writing apparatuses.